spooky friends. Welcome to another episode of Dairyland Frights, the paranormal podcast that covers everything spooky, creepy, and mysterious in the Midwest. My name is John, and I'm here with my two co-hosts, two co-hosts, Brooke and Megan. So we've learned Megan is a bear slayer. We've learned <laughs> uh, Brooke is an ego slayer, and I am a lowly crane slayer. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Yeah, I step mean, it up, John. <laughs> right? Uh, <sighs> doing good, though, you know. Just slaying some eagles as it goes. Yes. <laughs> Our Except national on, uh, Yeah, bird. Brooks is a gas <laughs> station. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actually kill an eagle, I swear. From our Just last episode, one. don't worry, people. Brooke did not kill an eagle. So don't, well, write us if you want. We don't care. Dairylandfrights, gmail.com. <laughs> But, yeah, even if it's even knows. if it's hate mail, we'll take it. Yeah, yeah. We, but she did not really kill an eagle, so please do not arrest her. Okay. All right. <laughs> so that's it. But I am super excited, ladies. This is our twentieth episode. Yes. <laughs> has crazy. it been that long? That's so awesome. It has been. Yes. That's crazy. And I want to say. I couldn't have two better friends to do this podcast. Oh, like same to you, John. <laughs> yeah. Even um, though they kill bears and eagles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though you know you yeah, gotta take so, the you gotta take the good with the bad. <laughs> <laughs> so today, Brooke, you got me. This is awesome. Our last one, Megan got me with bleeding tombstones and people's last name of blood and cursed stuff. You'll love that episode. But please tell us about this mysterious deer disappearance of an Ohio man that ended up not being what it seemed. Mm -hmm. You got me. I'm hooked again. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited. I think this will be a fun one. It's our 20th episode. This is such an interesting hey. story and I know neither of you guys are familiar with it. So no, I was no um yeah, it's 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 exciting. You you guys are going to be like, "What?" Um when I was researching, I wanted to uh, put together like a a compilation of like strange disappearances in the Midwest because I'm super interested in mysterious disappearances. Um and there's a lot of interesting ones, and I still plan on doing that kind of episode, but I came across this one disappearance that was so such a bizarre story that I just wanted to uh, talk about this one specifically. So I um, wanted to do an entire episode on it. So a couple things. I wanted to just mention my sources first. So I used discovery.com, um, United Press International, which I had never heard of before, but um, mm-hmm. had a really helpful article on it. And then Mental Floss. And a Madeira Tribune article from February 9th, 1965. Actually, a couple different um, newspaper articles from the, like, 60s. Um, so, very interesting. So, we're going to talk about the disappearance of a man named Lawrence Joseph Bader. And then the appearance of a different man named Ooh. John Fritz Johnson. So, first, oh, we're going to talk nice. about... <laughs> we're going to talk about Larry first. So... A little bit about Lawrence Joseph Bader. So he goes by Larry Bader. He was born on December 2nd of 1926, which makes him a Sagittarius. I always like to mention (laughs) the zodiac signs of the people I talk about. So Sagittarians, if you didn't know, are uh, interested in adventure. And, you know, they like to they like to travel. They like to go, you know, go to different places around the world. And just like they're always up for adventure. So keep that in mind a little bit. So, oh, Brooke and Megan, yeah. Brooke and Megan, can I do this really quick? I've always wanted to do this. Yeah, hey girl, what's your sign? <laughs> I'm an what? Aries, and I'm a Virgo. Yeah? What are, what's your sign, John? Taurus, the bull. Oh, you nice. Nice. Taurus. That's a good sign. Yeah, it's a yeah, it is. Yeah. I was just talking about how much I like Tauruses recently because yeah, that, your your you birthday go. must be coming up, right? In May. Yeah, is that? Yeah. April 28th. Oh, okay, people. end of April. Ooh, okay, coming up here. That nice. is coming up. Mm. Yeah, it's Taurus season. So, season of comfort and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure to send John a well wishes for his birthday. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. So uh, perfect. Uh, so uh, so yeah, so he was a Sagittarius. Um <laughs> So Larry, he dropped out of high school to join the Navy in 1944. 
Um, but he actually came back after two years and he finished up high school. He had and then attended one semester at Akron University. So he lived in Akron, Ohio. Um, and he was the son of a dentist. He had uh, considered following in his father's footstep, but he um, didn't do well in college. Uh, so he kind of Aww. had to figure out his own way. Um, he also was an outdoorsman. He loved fishing and he was very good at archery, like actually like very, very good at archery. So that was kind mm. of one of his passions. And the people around him described him as being pretty low key, very friendly, um, well liked and amiable, but overall, not like anyone too crazy or interesting. He was just kind of a normal young Midwestern dad. Um, so at the time our story starts, our story starts, uh, he is about 30 years old. Oh, okay. um, something to keep in mind as we go about this story is he did have some money problems mm -hmm. um so he attempted many business ventures that didn't pan out after he dropped out of college because he um he wanted to like make something of himself he wanted to like make his family proud so he kind of did a bunch of different random things and none of them really played out so he ended up being a kitchen appliance salesman um and he worked for the reynolds metals corporation and he made a decent living about ten thousand dollars a year at the time which was hmm. like the 19 late 1940s early 1950s wow, so that's pretty um, good actually yeah so pretty good for that time yeah that is good yeah um, however, he did have like quite a few debts because of all those ventures he had done beforehand. And it was also <laughs> estimated that he had not paid his taxes in about six years by the time that our story takes place. So Whoops. he did have some money, Naughty. some money struggles. Yeah. Mm. Um, just something to keep in mind again as we kind of go through all of this. Not anything too crazy, but sure. uh, but yeah. In terms of his family, he um, in April of 1952, he married a woman named Mary Lou Knapp. He actually met her during the one semester that he attended college. Aww. And as of March of 1957, Larry was married to Mary with three kids. And then Mary was pregnant with their fourth kid. Um, and so Mary Lou was like a very pretty woman. She was very well liked in the community. She actually graduated from college. So she had a degree. And, um, you know, so they had this nice little family that they were building. Um, and overall, things were going pretty well outside of the uh, the money struggles that he was kind of dealing with. So things were going pretty well. No one really expected anything otherwise of of his situation. Mm -hmm. However, in March of 1957, something a little weird happened. So oh. <laughs> while Larry made a decent living as a salesman, he didn't love the job. So he preferred to be outdoors. That was his passion. Um, so he would regularly go on fishing trips over the weekends, sometimes with friends, sometimes just by himself. Sometimes he would go do his archery thing on the weekends. And uh, Mary Lou was very understanding of this. She knew that that was what he always loved to do. So sometimes he would just kind of like disappear for a weekend and um, he would, you know, always come back. <laughs> but he he just really <laughs> liked to be outside. Um, so on March 15th, which was a Wednesday. Larry was 30 years old, th 30 years old. I feel like I, it sounded like I said three. Um, <laughs> he had um, a business trip that he was going on to Cleveland. So Cleveland is about an hour drive north of Akron. And he told his wife that he might go on a short fishing trip on his way back. Mm -hmm. okay. Mary Lou, she did not like this idea. Uh, oh. because there was um, a storm brewing like they were talking about it on the news there was supposed to be pretty significant storms that night um and larry he was kind of like oh whatever they're over exaggerating they always talk about these crazy storms and then it never like amounts to anything um, but mary she still was like well maybe you should just come right home afterwards and he uh, he just left and he said maybe i will maybe i won't <laughs> in regards to going on the trip oh, so larry yeah, yeah. sassy boy <laughs> sassy yeah that's Ooh. that's what he verbatim what she said that he said <laughs> um so larry went to cleveland and while he was in Cleveland, another thing to maybe keep in mind, he cashed a check for $400. He paid some outstanding bills. And one of those bills that he paid was in a, uh, an installment for his life insurance policy. Oh, suspicious. Yeah, a little suspicious. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, so then Larry, on his way home, he does decide to stop at the uh, Rocky River um, in like just outside of Cleveland. And he wants to go on a fishing trip. So... He rented a boat um, and the Rocky River. So it's right on the Rocky River and the Rocky River like uh, empties right into Lake Erie. 
And the guy who owns the boathouse, the proprietor, um, his name is Lawrence Kotlur. It's like French. Um, so he warned Larry that there was a storm coming in. And he was like, I really don't think that you should be going out there. But he said he would later say that Larry seemed really unconcerned about it. Um, and he was mm -hmm. like, I don't care. Like, I can handle myself. Uh, I just want to go on like a short trip. Um, so Larry insisted and he asked that the boat be equipped with lights to which Lawrence, the proprietor, was like, look, you're not going to need lights. It's not going to get dark for hours. And but Larry, again, he insisted that the boat have lights. And then hmm. Larry set out around 4.30 p.m. One other thing, another thing to keep in mind, all these little clues, we'll see how they tie in later. Um, Larry had a suitcase with him. That's what Lawrence uh -oh. said. The heck? Uh -oh. Yes. Well, it's like, why so, was he so insistent on having lights if you, like, yeah, we're only don't planning really on going out? Like, yes. Mm. So uh, we will see. This is so, fishy. Little fishy. Fishy. I get what you did there, John. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> fishy, <laughs> going, going That's a fishy. dad joke. <laughs> yeah, you're a certified dad joker. Yeah, very well timed. <laughs> uh, so he sets out at 4 30. Three hours later, the storm arrived, and it was, in fact, a big storm. They were not over-exaggerating. Um, and so we know the Great Lakes pretty well. More, We're more familiar with Lake Michigan over in Wisconsin. But uh, you don't want to mess with the Great Lakes when it's storming. You don't want to be out there. You don't want to be anywhere near there. It's, like, basically the ocean when, when it's storming. You got waves that are, like, 30 feet high. So he had not returned back um, by this time. So it was, like, 730. It started storming. It got dark out. Um, Larry had not shown back up, so they were pretty concerned, but the Coast Guard was, like, not going to go out there in those conditions. So the next morning, Bader, Larry Bader's boat was discovered on the rocks near Perkins Beach, uh, about five miles from the boathouse. Mm -hmm. Now, the boat had a bent propeller. Um, it was scratched. It was missing one of its two oars. Um, but it did not show any signs of having capsized. So it didn't, sh it didn't look like it had flipped or anything like that. Cause there was still stuff inside of the boat. Oh. Um, and the life jackets were actually still accounted for. So none of the life jackets had been used and the gas tank was completely empty. So kind of a, a lot mm. of like kind of strange things, but, uh, Larry was nowhere to be seen and his suitcase was not either. And according to the Coast Guard, Lake Erie had been so turbulent during the storm that no one would have been able to survive going overboard. So Ooh. they essentially, they um, they started looking for him. They spent about 24 hours pretty, um, like, very dedicated search of the area and of the lake trying to find Larry. Um, and they could not find him. And then it was reported in the newspaper, like a quote from the newspaper of, from the next day was the guardsman Thursday abandoned the search for Lawrence Bader of Akron, who was believed to have drowned while fishing off Rocky River Wednesday night. So they did continue to like kind of search for his body um, for two months after this happened, but they weren't mm -hmm. expecting to find him alive. They pretty quickly assumed that he had drowned just because the lake was was crazy and, you know, they didn't find any signs of him. Um, so the family ended up having a funeral for him and his life insurance policy was paid out to his wife and his kids. Um, it was, I think $40,000. So a pretty significant amount of money for the time. Yeah, and, that's a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and then Larry Bader was officially declared dead three years later, legally in 1960. They had already had his funeral by then, but. Um, but that's when they were like, okay, like he's gone for good. Like we can not coming back. Yeah. Legally pronounce him dead. So <clears throat> that's that. Right. However, something a little interesting happened. So four days after Larry's disappearance, a charming and elegant and well-dressed ma man entered the round table bar in Omaha, Nebraska, which Omaha is about 700 miles from Akron. Um, and I actually looked this up uh, at the time, like the mid 1950s, they both cities were actually like pretty ev even in their population. They both had about like 300,000 people in the oh, city wow. and surrounding areas. Yeah, I didn't realize Akron was so big, but because it's the yeah. fifth largest city in Ohio, but Ohio has a lot of big cities. So like Akron, I think, is about the size of Madison, where we live uh, today. And back then it was still pretty, pretty big. And Omaha is also big. It's grown much larger than Akron today, but at the time they're about the same size. Um, and Omaha, Nebraska is about 700 miles um, 
west, west of Akron. And so he walks into this bar and he introduces himself as John Fritz Johnson. So John Johnson, but he goes by Fritz, <laughs> um, which is, seems like a strange nickname for someone named John. But hmm. John, if you want to go by Fritz, let us know. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about last episode. I'm sticking with blood. Yeah. <laughs> you could be Fritz, Fritz blood. Whoa. Ooh, that's, that's crazy. That's a good alias. Fritz yeah. Blood. Fr- I love Fritz it. Blood. Yeah. Done. <laughs> done and done. <laughs> Perfect. Well, now we now we have that all set. Uh that's what John's changing his name to tomorrow. Uh, blood. I'm not John. I'm John Fritz Blood. <laughs> John Fritz Blood, yeah. That's, that's some, hey, for uh, some yeah. reason. Just really, hey, just really quickly, I looked up yeah. how much what you said 40 60 40 thousand dollars 40 thousand yeah policy it yeah would be worth in today's money hold on to your knickers <laughs> over four hundred thousand dollars okay wow. you know that is yeah it's a decent amount of money yes yeah, so like yeah day, we're just like you know with inflation we're like eh, yeah not like that what much. <laughs> Right? Like it is still a lot of money, but, but yeah. Yeah, back in that day. I mean, imagine if, if I handed you four hundred thousand dollars, Brooker Megan, you're sure not gonna get mad at me. Yeah, you're sure that's get, true. You know, exactly. That is true. Pay the house off. Uh-huh. Yeah. You'd be, you'd be set. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so that's a lot of money, in other words. So that's another clue I'd like to throw out there. So. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is a it's a pretty decent amount of money. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this Fritz guy, he uh he introduced himself to the the bartender and he actually had a navy issued driver's license with his name on it john johnson so um he he walked into the bar and he was looking for a job so he had a book of cocktail recipes under his arm actually and he was like hey i would love a job as a bartender um and they hired him because he seemed like a good candidate and he seemed very likable charismatic guy Um, (laughs) so easy back in the day yeah where i was like hey i want a job okay like okay hey, you got a driver's license let's let's bring you on board <laughs> put on uh, his apron good right? to go pretty much that's as, as hard as it was um so a little bit about fritz's backstory so fritz grew up in an orphanage in boston and he said that every boy who came into this orphanage who had no name like him they named them john johnson because it was generic but they all had unique nicknames so that they could tell them apart so he said that fritz was his nickname because he reminded the employees of a character from uh, a comic strip called cats and jammer kids that was popular in the 1920s and 30s there was a character i guess named fritz so that they called him fritz Um, however on a separate occasion he made up a totally different story and said that his nickname came from a haircut he got during world war ii that made him look like a german soldier so his friends started mm. calling him fritz he's a little uh, fibber isn't he yeah so you know who knows who knows what the real story is there um so uh, he was in the navy for 13 years and he was deployed during world war ii and the korean war um and fritz was also good at archery so he said he began started doing uh archery to help rehabilitate his back muscles because he had been in an accident and his doctor suggested that he um try archery to help with his back issues and he actually was so good that he won multiple regional and state tournaments in um in nebraska which is hmm. you know pretty cool he was really good at it yeah um here's some like weird things that he did though uh <laughs> you know he was a quirky guy so fritz would sign all of his checks as fritz he never went by john he only wanted to be known as fritz um he would also date his checks by season rather than month and date i don't know everyone uh, saw this mentioned multiple <laughs> times that they everyone thought that this was odd so he would write like summer instead of like june 10th um weird. he uh, also i feel like john will like this and maybe want to do this as well he drove around a hearse that was his main vehicle and he had like a lounging area in the back of it so he would take it on dates and he would like invite ladies to come back to his what hearse the hell? and they would, they would hang out in the back so you I ladies know. know me too well <laughs> this like already had you got one on order already yeah people were buying a hearse dairyland frights hearse <laughs> oh my god it'd be so fun we could deck it out and like our logo and all that it'd be like a party bus in the back yeah that would mm. be so fun i will have a mini disco ball in there oh man yeah, yeah. okay 
I like that. Oh, that would all be wow. right up Fritz's alley, I think. So mm. very fun. <laughs> so yeah, so he he drove around to hers, and he would also host parties regularly at his quote unquote strangely decorated Omaha apartment. I could not find in what way it was strangely decorated, but people thought it was strangely decorated. Um, he also had siamese fighting fish as pets and they would devour one another and i guess he would like bring people over to like watch his fish eat each other i don't know he's a freak (laughs) he's a little i love this guy yeah i I, I love him (laughs) he's well wait till you hear there's more there's a very he's a a very fun guy yeah how does it get worse i know (laughs) or Or better better. i think you know he's the the fish thing is a little bit sketchy but um Hmm. so when fritz first came to the town he originally like made a name for himself because, um, well, first of all, he had this like very eccentric, unique personality, and people thought he was like very entertaining, very personable, um, just just very likable in general. Um, and one of the first things he did when he got to Omaha was he lived <laughs> at the top of a flagpole for 15 days in order to raise money and awareness for polio. Which okay, what? okay, very interesting. How do you, do you can that? find. I, well, so I I was confused as well because I was like, like uh, the top of a flagpole is just like a little like how could you even balance up yeah, there? Yeah. But um, but I saw there's a newspaper clipping of it and they had a picture and there was like a it looked like a little box on top of it like it was I would oh. say it looked like a maybe like a ten by ten room or something like oh. that maybe a little bit smaller. Um, okay. But I don't know. I don't think he had like a like a, I don't know what he ate or like how he went to the bathroom or what I don't know I'll, I'll we'll uh, post it on Instagram and I'll send it to you guys okay. after but uh right. but yeah it was interesting but he but yeah so he was um you know in the news people were like this crazy guy's like living on top of a flagpole he raised <laughs> a bunch of money for for polio awareness I guess but <laughs> so he became kind of like a local celebrity because of this and then shortly after that he actually became a broadcaster for the local kbon radio station so a radio station in omaha so he broadcasted on um on there and after that he became so well known that they actually wanted him to be on tv so he became a sports director and broadcaster um on ketv7 so (laughs) so this at this point he like definitely is kind of a local small town celebrity i mean omaha is actually a pretty big city but pretty much everyone in omaha like knew who he was like you know people would recognize him walking down the street as you do with like your local news people and i think even more so back then because like everyone watched the news whereas now not quite as much but um so he was a really well-known guy and then in 1961 fritz married a 20 year old model named nancy zimmer i know yeah she was she was pretty Mm. she yeah there's pictures of her she was a pretty well-known lady as well and um she was actually divorced she had one daughter who fritz adopted and then Nancy and Fritz Aww. also had one more son of their own in 1963. One more interesting thing to keep in mind, you know, if you're if you're keeping a mental note of all these uh, interesting facts. <laughs> um, in 1964, Fritz had surgery on his eye because he actually had cancer, like a tumor, a cancerous tumor behind one of his eyes, and he had to get um, his eye removed along with Aww. the tumor. So he actually ended up wearing an eye patch which kind of added to his eccentricity so like everyone then everyone really recognized him because they were like oh there's yeah. you know, fritz he's got an eye her. patch he's super cool he drives a hearse you know he's just like this all right hold on hold, up. <laughs> hold up i'm getting an eye patch i'm driving a hearse <laughs> changing my name you yeah. will not recognize me next week I will be coming to your houses and picking you both up. I can't wait. Perfect. Yeah, I can't wait. This is, I can't wait to drive around in the hearse. Sounds like a great time. Uh, but yeah, he was a cool guy. Like, he seemed like a fun guy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so, let's fast forward a few years. Uh, now it is 1965. Um, <clears throat> so, Fritz, this is February 2nd of 1965. Fritz. Uh, as we know, an archery enthusiast, he went to, he was sent basically by his employer, something along those lines to demonstrate archery equipment at a sporting exposition in Chicago. 
um, at the McCormick place, actually, which I thought was kind of Ooh, cool because cool. that's still where they have all their expos. And I was like, yeah. this has been around for a long time, which makes sense. This wasn't like that long ago. It was 1965. Um, so one of we're, I'm just so used like I feel like so many of the stories we've talked about recently have been in like the 1800s. And I'm like, oh, this was <laughs> so long ago. But no, it's a little bit more recent than that. So something interesting happened. Someone who was attending the uh, expo was a woman named Susan Pica. And uh, Susan, you know, she was a Midwestern woman. She was from Ohio. She, you know, was a another outdoor sports lover. She was excited about this expo. She was there with one of her friends. And something about her is that she had lost her uncle for eight years prior during a boating accident. Uh, so mm. that's right. Suzanne was the niece of Larry Bader and she was attending the convention with a friend. So something mm. interesting happened. The Suzanne's plot thickens. <laughs> the plot thickens. Suzanne's friend was really interested in archery. So he actually had gone over and was watching um, Fritz demonstrate these art, this archery equipment. And he was looking at this guy and he's like, I swear this guy looks familiar. And he like, couldn't shake the feeling that this guy looked exactly like Suzanne's dead uncle. So oh. he goes and he finds her and she, he's like, you got to come see this. Like I, this guy looks just like Larry. And so Suzanne comes over and they're looking at him and he has an eye patch and he has a mustache, but otherwise like he looks like a spitting image of Larry. And Suzanne is like, I know this guy is my uncle. Like I have to talk to him. Oh. So, uh, they approach Fritz and um, and Suzanne is like, hey, I think you might be my uncle. <laughs> like, oh, what's going oh on? Boy. And apparently, um, like, Fritz showed no sign of recognition toward her and seemed, like, super confused. He was like, no, like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I don't, I've never heard the name Larry Bader before. I don't know you. He said, he was like, I don't have any ties to Ohio. I've lived in Omaha for years. And, you know, I before that, I lived in Boston. And, uh, you know, so he's really insistent and really convincing that he's not Larry. And so she, um, Suzanne, though, like after they left, she was like, no, I, I don't believe that guy. Like, I, th <laughs> I think that's Larry. So she actually found a phone, like a pay phone, and she called her family. And Larry actually had two brothers. So her two other uncles, um, I'm not sure what their names are, but two of Larry's brothers um, decided uh, to come to Chicago immediately when she let them oh know. My like, God. Hey, oh my God. Larry. Boy. Here we go. So his, yeah. So his two brothers fly to Chicago that night. The next day they go back to the expo and they go and find Fritz again. And um, the brothers agreed with Suzanne. They were like watching them and they were like, yeah, that's, that's our brother. Like we, we know, we know it. So they again confront Fritz and um, they're like, Hey, like, you're Larry. Like we know you're Larry. And again, Fritz doesn't seem upset or frustrated. He's a little bit like bemused if anything. And he's uh, very confused. So he's like, okay, like they, they're like, let's like take you down to the police station. And uh, like, cause Larry's fingerprints were on file because he was in the Navy. Um, uh -huh. So let's take you down there and let's, you know, would you be willing to go down there with us? And he, you know, to his credit was like, yeah, sure. Like I'll go down there with you guys. Like he wanted to kind of clear his name and be rid of this whole, like what he assumed was like a mistake in the identity thing. So he goes down to the police station with them and they get his fingerprints. And it turns out the next day they, the police called him back and they confirmed that Fritz and Larry were the same person. Their fingerprints no. matched freaking yeah. way they, dun, dun, were the, they were like 100 percent positive they're what? like yep oh. this guy is larry baby so i feel like and the family was like no th this is serious like we, mm -hmm. we know what you look like, like yeah they weren't even phased they were like, yeah they yeah, were not phased is... even though like he like, had an eye patch and a mustache again like if you look he looked quite a bit different when he had the eye patch and mustache but they were like this is our guy like this is crazy and he was eight years older too, so it's like he must have looked, you know, a little bit different. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, it's like where did he go during that time? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, well, he was in Omaha, just being a weird guy, <laughs> living on, flag yeah, living poles. on flagpoles, and yeah. Flag poles. So, uh, so this was like a huge shock for Fritz um, because 
from what he says, he had no idea. So, and this brought up like a ton of, like once it was confirmed that they were the same person, a ton of stuff had to kind of get squared away um, Mm. on his behalf. So he had unpaid debts before. And now all of a sudden it was like, okay, you, this, you got to pay them. (laughs) You're alive now. Um, And even the boathouse proprietor guy was like, Hey dude, you owe me a boat. (laughs) You crashed my boat. Yeah. Like even he was like, I would forget his boat money back. Uh, Same thing with like the insurance policy, like his life insurance policy had been paid out for $40,000. And now he was expected to like pay that back. That sucks. Uh huh, which is crazy. Um, and then in terms of his marriage status, since he was never officially divorced from Mary Lou, his marriage to Nancy ended up being void because you can't have two wives in the state of, I I mean, I think like nowhere in the U.S., but um, so yes, it was marriage to Uh Nancy. I I guess Uh not 100% positive, but I guess in Nebraska and Ohio, you cannot. Um, Woo, that's cool. So I know. Well, we don't know about Wisconsin. (laughs) I think in Wisconsin Uh also. Well, we'll see. <laughs> dang uh, it. Dang it. I was just about to get my second one. Uh, <laughs> and so in time, um, Nancy ended up leaving him. Um, you know, they were they were not married anymore, but she was like so confused about the whole situation. So she they, you know, interviewed like everyone involved in this at the time. And she just said that she had no idea what to think. She didn't know if she like could believe him if he was lying to her so they um they separated um and he did end up meeting up with mary lou again um and the kids in person in august of 1965 so about like eight months after um and uh, he still even upon meeting her when they met he still insisted that he had no memory of her that he had no memory of their children um, she describes this feeling of seeing him as like this weird sort of numbness. She said it was sort of like a numbness. I wasn't, it wasn't an emptiness. Like when I thought he had drowned, like she just mm. said, it was just mm. such a strange right. experience, which I can imagine like how bizarre. Um, hmm. And then in terms of his employment, um, he was ended up being let go from KETV seven um, when they found out that he wasn't, you know, who he said he was, even though, you know, to our knowledge, he was being truthful about yeah. who we thought he was. Right. Um, yeah. So he actually had to go back to working at a bar and the vast majority of his earnings went to his two wives for child support. So um, one article that I read said that 50% of what he made went to Mary Lou and her and their four kids. And then 20% went to Nancy and their, two kids well one was adopted so maybe just for the one but then that left him with only 30 percent for himself so he was really not in um in a great way Mm -hmm. but uh so things kind of just like collapsed for him unfortunately um but they ended up um actually like bringing on a team of psychologists and neurologists to assess larry's mental state because you know, with all of these things that he was suddenly expected to pay, he actually hired a lawyer because he was like, look, I can't, like, I don't have the money to pay for all this stuff. And so they said, well, let's get you checked out because there's, you know, besides his word, there was no real way for anyone to know whether he like had actually had like amnesia or if he was just lying about it the entire time. Right. So they brought in this whole team to kind of um, check him out and they, actually found no evidence that Larry was lying after a series of very exhaustive tests. And they, they all believed that he had no memory of his life in Akron or his life as Larry Bader at all. And in fact, um, well, Fritz slash Larry only ever referred to Larry Bader as quote, that other fellow when speaking of his past (laughs) life. So he would be like, I have, I don't know what that other fellow did. And, um, and he like really had no interest in like, learning about his past life either and right. one quote that he said to a reporter was uh my god don't you understand all of a sudden i find out that 30 years of my life never happened you see i really do have 30 years of memories as fritz johnson what am i supposed to do with those 30 years throw them out the door Which, like well, fair enough i That's guess legit. Yeah. yeah yeah but um Something kind of sad, um, very sad, is that in 1966, so just a year after he, you know, learned that he was actually Larry Bader, um, the cancer that had been in Larry's eye or like behind his eye um, actually reappeared as liver cancer. And he ended up entering the hospital 
on August 28th of um, 1966, and he actually succumbed to his cancer a couple weeks later on September 16th. Aww. So he was old. Yeah, he was only 39 years old, so he was really Mm -hmm. young um, and ended up passing away from his cancer. So um, in Omaha, and it was interesting, they didn't really know how to, like, approach the funeral. So they did actually have a funeral for Fritz in Omaha. So there was a service at First Methodist Church for John Fritz Johnson. And then they (laughs) transported his body back to Akron, where he was buried in a family plot at Holy Cross Cemetery as Lawrence Joseph Bader. So he had... Yeah, it was just so bizarre, like, because he had already had his funeral as Lawrence, as, like, Larry Bader, like, years prior. Oh, and, yeah. You know, like, so I don't think they had a second funeral for him. They just, like, buried him and, you know, put his name on his headstone, but very odd. Huh. Um, yeah. And then, according to one author familiar with the story, he said that this is... Uh, one of the most perplexing amnesia disappearances on record, a strange mystery that will never be resolved because he passed away shortly after it happened. So it's, you know, and now pretty much everyone who was involved has passed away. So Mm -hmm. um, to this day, no one knows the truth and probably never will, but um, people tend to follow one of two trains of thought. So the first theory, as you might imagine, is a lot of people think that he faked his own death. So uh, a lot of people think, like due to the mounting debts that he had and um, the socially restrictive environment, Bader faked his own death to start a new life in a more liberal Midwestern city. So I didn't know this, but apparently at least back then Akron, Ohio was considered a really um, like conservative and restrictive area. um, And Omaha Hmm. was considered like very liberal, which is kind of odd to me. Like, like Omaha, I don't know. Uh, yeah. but someone who lived in Akron actually said that the life that Fritz led in Omaha would have never been accepted in Akron uh, at that yeah. time. So huh. yeah. So him, you know, driving around her okay. and doing all his weird shenanigans, like wouldn't have been okay at the time in Akron. So, <laughs> um, so this would obviously explain things like him making that insurance payment and him having a suitcase and, you know, all these kind of like weird circumstances, but, uh, a lot of other people, think that it was actually an accident and that he um, did have amnesia legitimately. So um, friends from Larry Bader's home described Bader as having been very happy and enthusiastic and friendly in his Akron life. Like he had debts and he didn't love his job, but he really loved his family and he was a really good father. So no one really believed that he would have just wanted to completely start a new life. Um, And obviously there was never any evidence that he had lied. So um, there were a lot of people who believed that it was all legitimate and that he didn't lie. So um, one quote said that um, from one of his old neighbors said that he was a nice guy, not brilliant, maybe not even smart, but aside from that matter oh. of income tax, he was a solid citizen. So kind of made me laugh too. I was like, well, if he wasn't even smart, it would be pretty crazy to like come up with this entire mm-hmm. elaborate yeah, lie. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And like yeah. trick people who like researched your, you know, mind and your psyche. Yeah, like, he'd, exactly. he'd have to know a lot about psychology to fool them exactly that's what yeah sure. i agree um and then this was just interesting to me so i was kind of like i didn't really know that amnesia could like lead to you developing like a whole different set of memories like i didn't think that that was something that could happen but i guess right. like a certain type of amnesia called dissociative amnesia can lead to a person creating false memories in the absence of real ones um And it can also like specifically lead to them having an urge to travel and like settle somewhere, but then having like no idea how they got there, Um, which is, and usually people have dissociative amnesia due to like extreme stress or trauma. So there was actually like a recorded case of this happening in 2005 where a lawyer and a father of two um, disappeared from New York city and was found six months later living in Chicago in a homeless shelter under a new name. And then his wife said that he had been overcome by stress of his experience in the Vietnam War, as well as being near the World Trade Center on 9-11. So, um, yeah, so something similar had happened before. But but it's weird. Like, a lot of people think, like, the extent to which Larry had these, like, fake memories, like his you know childhood in the orphanage in boston was like very specific and um and the fact that he was like just living his best life because in other circumstances like this guy in new york city like he was you know in a homeless shelter like he was lost and confused and um like seemed that way and usually people like 
gain some of their memories back little by little, especially over the course of 10 years. And, um, and other people mentioned that it was unusual that he would retain his skill at archery because it would be something that you would forget. Um, So that was kind of interesting. Also, one other fun fact, and this kind of was like, oh, this kind of makes me lean uh, one way over the other way. Mm, um, but right. Barry's boss's name back in Ohio when he worked as a kitchenware salesman, his boss's name was Fritz. His first like, name. Oh, I like oh. this name. Oh. Yeah. Which is wow. not exactly a common name. So exactly. <laughs> a little <laughs> suspicious. suspicious. Mm. Yeah. A little suspicious yeah uh yeah so that uh so that's the story of uh very cool of larry larry bader slash fritz johnson but um very i'm cool. curious to know what you guys think i've a couple things that i wanted to like mention um or like you know discussion points i suppose you could say uh one thing that i thought might be interesting is and i never read at what point larry found out that he had cancer behind his eye and part of me was like well what if he knew that he had cancer and then he like wanted to disappear because he knew he was gonna die and he wanted to like make sure his family had money um oh that could be yeah because i think um somewhere else and i couldn't like really confirm this but something else that i read said that he specifically was like paying into this policy like and it was like specifically for accidental death so he had to like make his death look like an accident or something like that Uh, yeah um so there may have been some kind of truth to that you know and maybe that even like gave him more reason to pretend that everything was legit and he really didn't remember his wife and kids because again maybe he knew he was gonna die and he was like well i want to make sure everything's like legally squared away i don't know like it's kind of kind of interesting but uh yeah but yeah other people too think that the tumor behind his eye maybe has something to do with his memory loss like maybe it wasn't just simple amnesia right. maybe the the tumor like was doing something yeah. to his brain that made him lose his memories but um but yeah and then one other thing was that i just thought was interesting is so he disappeared on march 15th and then he apparently showed up in Omaha right. four days later with like full documentation of who he was like right. a driver's license that said John Fritz Johnson or whatever or just John Johnson and so I'm like how did he manage to get paperwork right. within uh-huh. four days that seems um yeah. seems kind of far-fetched so yeah. uh so yeah I don't know what do you what do you guys think I'm curious to know what you guys think because I feel like I'm like I was so deep into it, like reading all these theories. And I, you know, would love to to hear whether you guys think he literally had amnesia or was he faking it? So what what do you think, John? So I'm going to come clean to both of you right now <laughs> and to our listeners. John. I am not who I say I am. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. <laughs> Oh my gosh, he washed up on a beach. <laughs> so here's the fun thing. I thought, Brooke, you fooled me. I thought you were gonna go a different way because yeah, you know people. Um, you've probably have heard of this before, or at least it's in movies where people are something traumatic happens to them, and immediately mm-hmm. they become something totally different. So there's stories of people. I don't know seeing like their parents die in front of them and they're just so right. shocked they become like i don't know like um they like a movie star or something i'm just mm-hmm. you know where it's like and then they're like oh i'm uh you know jack johnson the movie star i'm in hollywood now and i'm doing these movies and everybody's like no 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 you're right jim smith and I'm like right no. <laughs> you know and then once they put them under which they didn't have this back then and they also do this with alien uh, uh, abductions. People have been abducted. You put it under hypnosis. And I yeah. was curious. You were, I thought you were going to say they're going to put this guy under hypnosis. And he was yeah. going to be like, oh, I'm, oh. you know, so-and-so and, and everything. Um, also, I just, I don't want to say he's a con man because I think that's a little strong to use. 
but right. some points in here point to like this guy had things planned and it's, yeah you gotta remember in the 60s they they don't have the therapy and the hypnosis and all these tools to help people with today to get past this but it's um really hard for me to believe that he wasn't full of it um just with some mm-hmm. of the things you're talking about um but then again like i mentioned in our slender man episode um the girl who did the killing she had early form of schizophrenia which schizophrenia right. they have found today gives you personality disorder so in other words kind of gives you some different things where you know i'm you know fritz and you, right. you can't convince me other than i'm fritz and mm-hmm. it's because it's a friend so i think it's a combination of different things and then last but not yeah. least the, the cancer before behind his eye i thought you were gonna say he had been abducted by aliens <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have been awesome you know uh, and that caused maybe, cancer you know? <laughs> Right, like he was on Could the boat, be. and there was some weird light. Like he was, I thought you were going to say halfway through the story that he was on the boat, and this weird light happened, and that <laughs> next thing he knows, he's frets. And well, and that's why you never he's, know, right? Yeah, maybe that was the so, traumatic experience that like triggered everything. Who knows? I mean, maybe like you know, bar, not necessarily one hundred percent to do with aliens, but maybe maybe the like boat right. accident was super traumatic for him. And yeah. that is so, what like triggered it. A long but. story short, I think it, my opinion is that something traumatic happened to him. He became this person that he always wanted to be. And, yeah. you know, cause we all, you know, all of us inside of us have like, man, if I only could be this person, like maybe mm-hmm. be a little more gregarious at parties and maybe meet some new people. And, and yeah, then you're like, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and then he just something just shocked him into this, whether it be yeah. debt, stress, I have a crappy job. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. So that's kind of I my think... that's kind of what I think. It's just kind of a combination of a different factors, uh, without aliens. <laughs> and that he <laughs> But maybe this, aliens. But, yeah. Well maybe aliens. Yeah, Let's not throw that out. So Megan, what yeah. do you think? <laughs> All I can think is like what a dramatic way to start over. Like right (laughs) he took it a little far for me i feel like i would have believed that maybe you know he was you know just living his life he took a trip like he was really passionate about fishing and you know it was an accident maybe he, he did develop amnesia but like all those little details that you mentioned about like mm-hmm. preparing for the trip like exactly. that, that kind of yeah threw me off a little bit and like like you mentioned it's like that all those awesome amazing things that he was able to do in his new life he never would have been yeah. able to do that in his own life and maybe exactly. he felt like he was tied down and stuck and he just wanted to be a new person and another mm-hmm. thing i thought about is um i'm not sure how like he put together this like backstory of who he was because he was saying oh I was in an orphanage in this city Mm -hmm. but like they didn't have the internet back then so it's like how are you developing this seemingly true story without actually like being to these places and like you I mean maybe he did get those identification papers like in the works before he had this before he like disappeared yeah yeah, yeah, so I feel like at the beginning I would have been like, oh yeah, you know, he had a traumatic incident, and I don't. Who knows, John? Maybe he was abducted by aliens after he <laughs> maybe <laughs> he I'm crashed right. the boat. There's, there's no way of saying. <laughs> yeah, no one will know. But I I feel like I would probably go with maybe it was something he was beginning to set up, but I do believe there might be some sort of psychological yeah. effect, like yeah, it, to right. some capacity. Yeah, because the the one thing that kind of like makes me think, well, maybe there was some kind of truth behind it is like the fact that when they were like, hey, we want to go get your fingerprints tested, like, let's go to the police station. He was like, OK, and like just went with them because that's another like, thing. Yeah, because yeah. like, when he saw his family, he wasn't like panicking, like, oh, my God, they found me. Yeah, oh, right. yeah, and they said that Absolutely. he really like, yeah, like he legitimately didn't seem like he knew them at all. Like he, you know, he saw his brothers and his niece and everything, and he was just kind of like, "Who are you guys?" Like, didn't have any kind of recognition, and you know, either like he's a really good actor, and like 
maybe he was just like, yeah, oh, the jig is up. I'm well, just going to go with them and, you know, yeah. we'll do what we do. But um because again it was that was only a year before he passed away from cancer so again i wonder like i don't know how much like cancer or i don't know like what the medical system was like back in the 60s but uh like if he knew like if he knew that they were if he had been going to the doctor and they were like hey you're gonna die within a year maybe he was like you know what like i'll just (laughs) let them find me i guess i don't know but he never like like gave up the he never said you know, admitted that, oh, I know that I'm Larry Bader or whatever. So you'd think, I don't know. It's just like, it's so interesting. I wish yeah, like, interesting. we knew, wish we had a an answer, a set answer, but. Yeah, that is yeah. really, really interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting um, disappearance, but. And reappearance. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh you want me to read this? I can read this. You you, you kind of mentioned this is oh you know, let us yeah know, oh yeah let us know what you think. Yeah, um, did Larry fake it? Was he legitimately suffering from amnesia or some kind of combination? I feel like we lean towards towards that a little bit. But send us an email at dairylandfrights at gmail Also, if you are interested in an eccentric weird guys, the Hodag episode, <laughs> the very first yes. episode, I feel like that's similar. So crazy, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah that is awesome um yeah so uh, brooke uh, amazing show you took me in different directions which was awesome <laughs> i'm trying to keep I'm you guessing like, you know I, i'm <laughs> changing my name on monday john fritz mm-hmm. blood got the, uh, get the hearse, get the hearse. <laughs> we will get that taken care of we get it detailed um Ooh, a little party yeah hearse. um yeah put a disco ball town. in the back a little disco we'll come uh, to your town yeah sure what the heck uh, uh, yeah so that is awesome so again great story uh loved our stories like i said please um rate us five stars subscribe so you don't miss any of our shows because these are some really interesting we're only going to have so much more interesting shows down the line well, we have tons of ideas yeah tons uh, of ideas trust me <laughs> you will you will love it and uh i'm excited about all that and again, tell your ghost you say hi. And if it isn't a ghost and it's somebody trying to pretend they're a ghost, you know, maybe ask for some ID and, you know, try to figure <laughs> out who they really are. Yeah. Uh, but you never know, right? Um, so anyway, great show. Um, looking forward to more shows. Again, our 20th episode. Thank you so much, uh, ladies, yes. for, <laughs> for getting here. I mean, this is so amazing. 20th show. So It Love is. It. It's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Megan Brooke, I will see you later. Stay spooky and you too, John. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> you too. Until next time. Until next Until time. Until next time.